In the house of the Lord together one more time and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, as Pastor Sian mentioned, uh, we want to make sure that you know that this Tuesday we won't have a meeting. This Tuesday we switched it to Monday to have a, we're going to have only this week, Monday at 7.30 we're starting uh, our service. We are ending our 21 day fast on this Monday. And uh, please understand, when I say we're ending, it means it's not finished until midnight. So don't look at Monday, oh, Monday 21st, praise God, meet time. <laughs> 22nd meet time. 21st still fast time. 21st still fast time. 22nd meet time. And I was thinking about this a lot because some of you guys are vegetarian and some of you guys are vegans. And I said, this was not fast for you. This was like your normal lifestyle. So, so, what, what, so what we're doing is for people who were vegan and uh, they were, they were at the, you know, they are vegetarian. We are going to, right after this fast, we're having a new fast. <laughs> and it's going to be the lion fast. 50 days. <laughs> For 50 days, we're going to just eat meat. So those who are... <laughs> so we're going to eat all the meat for 50 days. We're going to have a lion fast. <laughs> it's going to be a lion fast. So, and that, that, is, that, that idea didn't come from me or me did it. That came from Brother Frankie. You know, he says we need to have a lion fast because, you know, that's the, the reality is, the truth be told, you know, lions, they eat meat. Yeah. And they're strong. They're very strong. And cows eat grass. I don't need to say the rest of it. <laughs> so lion fast is going to be good. I know everybody will love lion fast, you know, uh, and uh, nobody will have a problem with the lion fast, right? Uh, I'll behold the lamb. It's going to be very good. Uh, Friday night, our gospel encounter service at the art gallery. That is our church evangelism every Friday. And this Friday, the whole church is going to be there. Uh, so there's no Friday at uh, house church uh, uh, this, this Friday because we're all meeting downtown. And uh, Twasen, there is no house church on Thursday either. Uh, but the other house churches that are on Wednesday and Thursday, they can still meet. Uh, but in Tuasen, we don't have a house church uh, uh, this Thursday. But uh, the North Man and Surrey, they are Wednesday and Thursday. We are still meeting, but make sure you guys going to be there on Friday. Amen. amen. And uh, we're going to have a, we want to celebrate together in Jesus. Amen. amen. We, want to, we want to have a big celebration. You know, I, I'm so blessed by when I was watching uh, the Hungarian church down uh, when Brother uh, uh, Frankie was uh, down there in Budapest. They didn't just come there. To just clap their hands or came there to just give tracks out. They had a service. They danced before the Lord. Amen. They worship God. They celebrate before the Lord. Amen. And we are not coming there to just do a duty. We are coming there to celebrate our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are coming for celebration. He is worthy of our celebration. Amen. The same way you celebrate on a Sunday morning, on a Tuesday night, and whenever you are together, we want you to come to celebrate. Understand that we are free and free indeed. Amen. You know, I was sharing on the, uh, with the, the Twasen Church on Thursday, I said to them, I said, you know, the reality is freedom cannot be taken away from you. Yes. Yes. But you can give away freedom. Yes. Jesus gave you the freedom. Amen. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. You're free. Amen. If you're not free, you gave it away. We give our freedom away because our freedom is in Christ Jesus. So, so if anybody tells me, hey, you're not free because of whatever, I say, I'm free. I don't know what you're talking about. My freedom is in Christ. Yeah. And in every circumstance, I am free because I believe in the scripture, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen? So just remember that you're free at all time. You're free in the Lord at all time. You're free to worship God at all time. Anytime, everywhere that you are, you ought to give him the highest praise, which is to our Amen. 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 And uh, next Sunday, we're going to have baptism in Langley. It's going to be exciting. We're going to have uh, at least two people getting baptized right after service. It's going to be awesome. Anybody else wanting to get baptized, please come and uh, see us after service. It's going to be awesome, the baptism. And we're believing more and more people are coming for baptism. Amen. Amen. Uh, 
I, uh, our, our evangelism crew uh, somehow made sure that we didn't have the 4 by 6 cards in my car and they put in the storage. But, uh, uh, but uh, it is in the storage. <laughs> I, I was looking in my car back and forth everywhere, couldn't find them. That's alright, I'll go into the storage and get it for tomorrow night and give it to you. But we have printed 6 by 4 cards that, that was designed for Resurrection Sunday event. And uh, it's going to be the smaller version of this, uh, 4x6 with information at the back of it as well. But we also printed posters, five posters. For those of you who might feel that you have, uh, yeah, um, yeah, this is going to be the six by four size that we're going to bring it back tomorrow, and we'll hand it out that you can give to your friends and uh, family and invite them to our resurrection uh, service weekend. Um, and uh, but if you have somewhere that you can post this, whether it is at your workplace or place of business that you can post it. I'm going to leave it over there. Please do take them and post them. We want to make sure that we can invite as many people as possible to come to this uh, uh, time of uh, celebrating our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to basically have uh, our uh, resurrection service on uh, Saturday with Good Friday at 4 p.m. Uh, to 8 p.m. And Saturday, April 16, 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. And Sunday, uh, we're going to be there from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, are going to be our celebration weekend. It's going to be amazing celebration weekend. Uh, I, I know that God is favoring us. I thank God for favoring us. God is amazing. Uh, we have uh, received permission from the art gallery to be there and uh, they already told us that uh, it will not cost us a penny which is, uh, praise God, we don't need to pay for the, using the facility. Uh, but, uh, of course, we are, uh, we are going to be doing things uh, that's going to be very uh, awesome. The team that is uh, in charge of it, uh, they're doing an amazing work. There's going to be celebration on Saturday for kids, family events. We're going to have Bible studies, as much as preaching that is happening. It's going to be an amazing weekend because we are celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ because he is the reason why this world is still intact. This is the reason why the mercy of God is still on earth and the mercy of God is still covering the sinful world and the wrath of God is not poured out yet. There comes a time that he's, the Spirit of God is no longer traveling with man and love grows cold and the judgment of God will come. But until then, we will celebrate. And then, after those miserable seven years, we'll come back with the Lord and rule this earth. Amen. And we will celebrate for, seven, for a thousand years together with Him. Amen. And after that, the final judgment and eternity forevermore in our Lord Jesus Christ. What a rejoicing that day will be. What a rejoicing years that will be. What I can say today is I choose to celebrate now. I'm not waiting for those thousand years. Now we're waiting for eternity. We have to choose to celebrate our resurrected Christ. But those seven years is going to be a dreadful years for all who do not have Christ in them. That's why we evangelize. That's why we preach the gospel. Because those seven years are going to be years of trouble. It declares it's going to be the years of pain and suffering for many. But only those who are Christ Jesus are free and liberated. Amen. And those seven years, we cannot do anything to stop the Antichrist because he has to be in power. No protest in those seven hours will stop it. No demonstrations will stop it. Nothing will stop it because he will be given seven years of full reign. But only those who are in Christ Jesus have a voice. Isn't that a blessed assurance? Yes. Yes. Isn't it awesome yes. to be in Christ Jesus? Yes. Knowing that we are free is awesome. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I want to wish my Hungarian brother, Attila, at the back. Attila, where are you? Happy oh, I see. New Year. I want to wish my brother, the Hungarian brother, Attila, and Mike, uh, and uh, Charlie, and Brother Frankie. Brother Frankie, all of them from the Majoristan. <laughs> Happy Persian New Year. <laughs> we all are <laughs> we are part of the, you know, <laughs> Majoristan, all the stunts. Uh,
today is Persian New Year, and uh, it's uh, the celebration of uh, basically we entered into a springtime. And uh, this year is a day earlier. Usually it's on Mar it's Mar on March 21st, yeah. but uh, the sun, the, the earth decided to fast forward this year and circle the earth much faster. And, uh, and uh, it's all right. You didn't miss nothing. It's, uh, it, it, and the, the thing is about Persian New Year that is unique is. Around the world, everybody at the same time celebrates. It's not the midnight hour. It's exactly when the Earth circles the Sun, 365 days, wait, 365 days, and at that moment, the whole world celebrates the Persian New Year. The problem with being living in Canada and celebrating Persian New Year, Chinese New Year, one day late, Canadian New Year, uh, all sorts of New Years, you're always celebrating and eating. <laughs> You start in January, you go into February, you go into March, then you go to April, it's, you know, the celebration continues and we are always feasting. That is the problem for my waist, but uh, it is good for the Lord to be uh, celebrating cultures. God creates cultures, God Amen. has created nations and God has created tribes. And uh, we, it's good to celebrate together because it is the creation of what God has done. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. But let us pray, go before the Lord. I'm going to, uh, by the grace of God, I'm going to be finishing this uh, sermon today. Um, and um, uh, the series, uh, The Right House. And, uh, and I'm, I'm excited for the word that God has for us this morning and, and where we're going in the direction the Lord is leading us. Amen. Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that the blessings of you, Lord, would overshadow us in this moment in our life, O oh God. Father, I ask you that your supernatural way will be revealed Amen. and your people will be blessed and healed and delivered and yokes will be broken of their lives. Amen. I pray that you will set that those who are in captivity, O oh Lord God, that are watching us via uh, internet, uh, they're not here, O oh Lord God, that you set them free from the captivity of their heart, mind, and spirit, O oh Lord God. Amen. The power of God operate wherever you are in the fullness of the glory yes. of your kingdom. I thank you for what you are about to do, Lord God, in all of our lives, oh Lord God, in Canada, across the nations, to bring salvation Amen. to as many that are willing to hear what the King of Glory has to say. Amen. In Jesus' precious name, our Savior. Amen. We left last week at a point that David had made a covenant to make the uh, call Abenar to bring his wife uh, Michael back to him again. Yeah. And a lot of things had, had to be done and a lot of things had to pull together and David finds himself in the situation now after all of those things that Abenar is dead and David gets right behind Abenar's casket and starts crying. The people of Israel saw how David loved Abinar, Saul's cousin, and their hearts were impreded to David because you can be legitimate on the paper, but if you are not connected by your heart, no one sees for what you should be. When they saw David walking behind the casket of Abinar, who is literally of the house of Saul, and David is the house of David, and David is the stronger house, but he humbled himself and walks behind the casket of the weaker house, weeping, captured the heart of Israel for himself. See, sometimes we miss our opportunity because our heart is not ready, our head is ready for the position, but our heart is not ready. The Bible says God chooses by the heart, not by the head. God looks at the heart, not by the head. God looks at your heart, not your strength, what you can do. When Israel wanted to have a king, just like the he, like the Gentiles, they wanted a king that looked like the other kings. Yes. And God gave them a king in the form of Saul. Mm -hmm. But he didn't have the heart of God. He didn't have a heart after God. He had his own agendas as much as he was anointed by God. He didn't have a heart after God's heart. 
And that's why he couldn't repent when, when things were wrong and done wrong. He was always finding excuses for his mistakes. But when God finally made a choice, what king is going to choose? He chose a king that was after his own heart. When the prophet Samuel went to Jesse's house to select the king, Jesse was looking at who is the strongest, who is the tallest, who is the best warrior, who can take this kingship. And every single son that came before Samuel, the prophet, God says, not this person, not that person, because what you're looking is on the outward. What I'm looking is on the inward. And I'm looking on the inward of the person to select, because you can have head smart and have all sorts of gifting and talents, but if your heart is not in the right place, nothing can change. God only can change a person's mind and give them a mind of Christ when their stony heart is changed to the heart of the flesh, when Christ becomes their heart. Then God can change them. God can put the mind of Christ because their heart is changed and they now have a heart after God. And God can transform their, by their mind by renewing it to the mind of Christ. We choose people by their head and we live with their heart. But God chooses people by their heart and he, equip, he equips their head. God chose King David because he was a man after God's heart. Was he perfect? No. Definitely not. We know that about the Bible. Did he mess up? Definitely he messed up. But he was after God's heart. And therefore, he was a repentful man and he repented before God when things rose up and God called him out of it. My brothers, my sisters, I want to submit to you a very important subject regarding the heart of man. It's because our heart dictates our destiny. And our heart dictates how we deal with the matters of God's purpose in everyone's life. I know this message is important because my laptop even doesn't want to show the message. I had everything properly set up and everything suddenly went blank. And I said, praise God, this is this is good day. This is a good day. This is a good day. Praise God. When the people saw a lot of things, uh, when people saw how uh, David was, they saw what God saw. No matter where we read in the scripture, it always says that says God was with David and God trusted him. Nowhere in the history of King David, God says God wasn't with King David. Yeah. He was always with King David. Amen. Because he had a heart that was after God's own heart. The key word is, he was after God's own heart. He didn't have God's heart. He was after God's own heart. Amen. It meant that he was searching daily to have the heart of God. Mm -hmm. Today, what David desired for many years, searching and following, today we have the opportunity through the Holy Spirit to actually have the heart of God. By a transformation of the power of the Holy Spirit by the newness of being born again in Christ Jesus. What David was desiring daily in his life that made God be with him, God is declaring to us as believers in Christ Jesus, you have access to that to become yours. All you need to do is be born again. Be born again by the Spirit. Be born again and let me turn your heart of the stone to the heart of flesh that you can grasp my heart. How do I know that? It's in the scripture. It says to us very clearly, out of our belly shall flow rivers of the living waters. Because when the Bible declares that, that out of our belly shall flow rivers of living waters, it's declaring 
that the heart of God has transformed us and now living waters are living in us and through us and we ought to feed the people that are dying in the process. Remember a story in the Bible that says the city was cut off of the water by the enemy and the stream was not coming down and there was no water coming and they were dying, all sorts of livestock was dying. May I suggest this morning to you that the enemy has cut off the livestock of the living waters to people who do not have Jesus Christ and he's not allowing them to see what it is but God has chosen us for such a time as this to become the living waters to them. Even though the living waters are flowing into our cities, into our, uh, into our workplaces, we have become the living waters to go to those places and bring them back to life and give them life by letting them to drink of the living waters. God let Israel see King David's heart as well as, as, uh, uh, as the, he was crying behind the casket of Abner, they saw the heart of King David. As the way God knew his heart, they knew now his heart as well. God is about to give King David the fulfillment of a prophecy that happened to him when he was a kid. There are some things that God had whispered to you in your youth and all of a sudden it's coming to pass. Certain things had to happen, circumstances had to change, certain people had to die, certain people had to move, certain things had to shift in your life, but God is ready to do what He had called you to do from a long time ago in your life. King David made arrangement to take back in marriage Michal and order to bring the, the purpose of God to pass. It was necessary to take her back because once he took the throne as the king of Israel, he didn't want nobody to be telling him to have the right to the throne because she's still an heir of Saul and she could contest the kingship of David. Maybe she would not become the queen, but her husband, through Aaronus, could have received that title. David was a man that sought the face of God and the plans of God and, and he needed the house of David and Saul together that there would be no competition or nobody to come and try to take the throne which belongs to him which was prophesied by God because he wanted the plans of God to come to pass. She's the daughter of King Saul, don't forget that. She has the same spirit on her that King Saul had. We know that by the evidence later on we read that when the Ark of the Covenant came to Israel and David was rejoicing in his undergarments and he was praising. And by the way, when the Bible says the undergarments, it's not the undergarments we wear today. The undergarments in that Old Testament was actually full clothing. It was, a, it was a totally from the, they were covered. So people, people have this image in Hollywood and they had the, you know, one actor act that he was in his underwear that undergarment means basically he had something fully dressed like me underneath they, they, they were dressed like this similar to this and they, had, they were fully dressed and and and, 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 in, and the meat of it there was clothes like pajamas may I say it was like a pajama but he was so excited for the glory of God that is in the that has come back in the way of the Ark of the Covenant, that he ran on the street and he was worshiping God and dancing before the Ark, and because his wife is the wife of <laughs> the daughter of King Saul, she has the same spirit, because the pride of life and the glory of life is more important to her, and she rebuked him and said, "Is that what a king should be doing?" Should a Christian be dancing before the Lord in the streets? Should a Christian be dancing in the house of God? Is that is it worthy of, 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 of our culture, of our characteristic? Because we have to be a little bit more proper than it is. 
But the scripture is very clear. When the glory of God is in the place, and the presence of God in this place, we ought to be rejoicing. We ought to be dancing. And the scripture says, where two or more gather in my name, I'll be in your midst. Wherever we are in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, He is there. And the joy of the Lord shall cause us to be able to rejoice and shall cause us to be able to dance and shall cause us to step up and declare that He is great and He is worthy to be praised. Amen. When we're sinning, nobody had to tell us to dance. When we're living righteous, we have to people say to us, can you dance? When God is calling us into righteousness, nobody has to tell us, the people have to t- tell us what it means to walk after righteousness. And we have to pray about it. And we have to seek the face, God, face of God about it. And we have to get a revelation about it. But my brothers and my sisters, when I was sinning, nobody needed to give me no revelation and I did not need to confirm with Satan that I needed, I'm going to the nightclub and drinking and getting, uh, doing all sorts of nonsense and I'm, I'm, I'm living a life of sin. I didn't need no confirmation from Satan. I just did what I was told by the sin of my life and by the spirit of this world. But when it comes to the ways of the Lord, we need confirmation. We need a reaffirmation. We need something to come back on the... God is speaking to us already. He says, I am here with you. I have set you free. I don't need to repeat it. I don't need to reconfirm it. This is my way. This is my will. And I'm asking you to just do it. Before there was Nike, there was Jesus. <laughs> Here people call that praise God. <laughs> Sister Benita told me I need to get more jokes from a better place. <laughs> my, 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 my joking <laughs> resource is a little bit running empty. <laughs> so I need to, I need to get into the update, upgrade. I need to upgrade. <laughs> I need to upgrade. She fought, she fought her husband for rejoicing in the Lord and rebuked him. And the Lord judged her because of it. But he knew that it was necessary for him to marry her, to fulfill God's will. Sometimes you've got to be able to work with people that you don't really want to work with. In order to fulfill God's will. I'm going to repeat that. Sometimes you want, you have to work with people that you don't really want to work with in order to fulfill God's will. God knew Judas was going to betray him, but he chose to breathe the Holy Spirit on him that he would do exactly what the rest of the disciples were doing. Don't think for a second that Judas wasn't healing people. Don't think for a second that he wasn't preaching with the other ones. Don't think when God sent the disciples out to, 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 pray, to, to go and proclaim the gospel and they saw demons flee away and all those things. And Judas was right in the midst of them. Yeah. When they came to report to Jesus about what is happening and they saw demons run away and then they flew away. And Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like a lightning from heaven. I'm not saying this is what the Bible says. I'm saying perhaps when he said it is important that your name is written in the book of life. Perhaps he was talking directly to Judas. Because Judas was a monster. And Judas, his name was not written in the book of life. He says, all of these things that you see is great because I've seen Satan fall like a lightning in heaven. It will happen. It was necessary for Judas to be part of the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ because he had a purpose to betray our Lord Jesus Christ. There's purpose for people in your life to do things that they do, including when they hurt you. Yes. Amen. Wow. Three people are excited about that. <laughs> it is necessary for me to be afflicted. It was good for me to be afflicted, the Bible says. 
because that's when I know that God is walking with me. That's when I know God is upholding me. That's when I know that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. That's when I know that who is with me is greater, who is in me is greater than who is outside of me. That's when I find out and God allows certain people come to your life and He says, learn to accept it. the good, the bad, the ugly, all things for God, for good, for those who are called accordingly to His name and purpose. All things works out for good. Amen. We rebuke the bad, we accept the blessing. How can we rebuke the bad and accept the blessing? Sometimes the bad is necessary for us to be where we are today. Yes! Do you think? Do you think today as a church we are where we are if COVID didn't happen? Nobody's talking back to me. That's all right. Yes. I will talk to you. Yes. If COVID didn't happen, we would not be the church that we are today. We could not walk with the power that we walk in today. We could be bold the way we are today. We would be drawing people from the north and the south and the east, and God would not bring us all together. We were comfortable where we were, and we were enjoying where we were because everything was accordingly to what we enjoyed. And even God would tell us and scream at us, "You need to shift and you need to move." We would shift because we're comfortable. God says, "I'm going to use this poet." Even though it's evil, I'm going to use it to bring my glory, my honor, and my praise. That's why I can praise God for COVID. I can praise God for lockdown. I can praise God for uh, for mandate. I can praise God for everything because I know that we're working for good for us who are in Christ Jesus to become stronger and mightier and know that He is Lord to watch His mercies walking amongst us, to watch His glory coming for us, to see that He's covering us against the plan of enemy and the enemy will not succeed because we are covered by his glory. We have to learn how to thank God in the valley before we know how to praise him in the top of the mountain. Only people who have learned to worship God in the valley, in the place that they are, everything is bad, they know how to cherish the mountaintop experience. And they will never forget where God wants to honor. They will always praise Him. Even when at the top of the mountain the storm rises up, they still will choose to praise God. Even if God takes them back to the valley, they will still choose to praise God because they have experienced God in a way that no one can change that. And King David knew something about that. Mm -hmm. And we need to know something about that as well. Hallelujah. 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 What did God do? What did our Lord Jesus Christ do to Judas? He says, Judas, go do what you're supposed to do. That's right. Go. You can go. And when he came to kiss him, he says, yeah, that is it. You betrayed me with a kiss. Kiss. Some people will love you and betray you. Some people will love you and betray you. But Jesus didn't get angry. Our Lord didn't get angry. He says, no, it's part of the plan. 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 Messages for you to remember a word was shared here last year that I want to remind you of. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for reminding me as well. Remember the scripture where Jesus was sitting with his disciples before the Last Supper, before he was, uh, he, before he could release the covenant of the great communion. He went to Judas and says, Judas, leave. Leave the room. This is not for you. This is not for you. You need to leave. Do what you're supposed to do. Messages to you. A word was shared here last year by our brother David Brown from Calgary. He says, the churches had to leave and close down and stay home because the covenant that God had with them, it wasn't for them. This covenant that was for people who were only the Holy Ghost. Those who were not afraid to stand out across the nation 
that's another the, the, the name of the fellowship is gospel tabernacle or whatever else this is a covenant that God is making with believers that have the boldness that say it doesn't matter what anybody wants to say we will do the will of God and we will follow after him so don't be angry at people and churches who are shutting down and doing vaccine passports and masks and this and that. Don't be upset at them. It wasn't for them. They had to go. They had to leave the room. They had to leave the presence of God. But every other church that decided to be in the presence of God, they remained. They remained strong. It didn't matter where they are, they remain strong. Please understand, we are not the only church. I want to make sure that you understand. We are not the only church that did this. Many churches have done, and many churches have been doing it. And many churches are still doing it. And we are just part of that many churches that are doing it. We have the evidence. 2,300 churches joining together to fast and pray for the nation. Amen. We have the evidence. We know of only 2,300. We don't know about much more. I believe there is so many people out there that are bold for the Christ Jesus that we haven't met yet. We'll yes. meet one day. Amen. God wants you to know today, just like He spoke to Elijah, Elijah, don't say you are the only prophet left. I have many hidden that you do not know. That's right. Gospel tabernacle, don't say we are the only one that is left in the city. I have many that have hidden that you do not know of. Amen. You do what I'm asking you to do. I will bring those who need to do what they need to do. But you don't worry about who is there and who is not there. You just do what I'm telling you to do. Amen. Sometimes it's not up to us to know. Because if it was up to us to know, God would let us know. You can have a prophecy over your life, but you still cannot, you, you still gotta allow God to position you to protect that prophetic word over your life. You got to let some people go and take some people. You need to let let me rephrase that. You need to let some people go and you need to take some people in to protect the prophecy that is over your life. I had to share all of these for the last week and a little bit now to get to the meat of what the Lord wants us to know. All of that was a pretext. All of that was a setup for what the Lord really wants us to know as a church. That God has not forgotten about you and He has a place in the right house for each. Amen. Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 9, Second. verse 1 to 11. Second Samuel. Or as my British friends like to say, to Samuel. I, if you hear ever a British man preach or a British lady preach, don't get upset because I always I get always confused. They say, you know, one Samuel, two Samuel, or two kings and one king. So wow, I did not know there's two Samuels around. <laughs> <laughs> and then they never get upset at me. So we speak the proper English. You guys are speaking the North American English. And uh, but uh, you know, I, I'm still trying to figure out which one is right. I still don't speak English, so I'm trying to figure out which one is right. But Second Samuel chapter nine, verse one to eleven. Actually, verse one to eleven. Verse one to eleven. And if I can I get the sister Shirley help me to read it, it would be greatly appreciated. I'm reading the Amplified Classic. And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I may know show kindness of Jonathan's sake? And of the house of Saul there was a servant whose name was Ziba. When they had called him to David, he said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, I, your servant, am him. The king said, Is there not still someone 
of the house of Saul, to whom I may show the unfailing and sought unlimited mercy and kindness of God. <clears throat> Ziba replied, Jonathan has yet a son who was lame in his feet. And the king said, Where is he? Ziba replied, He is in the house of Meke, a son of Emiel in Lodibar. The king David sent and brought him from the house of Meke, son of Emiel at Lodibar. And Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and did obeisance. David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold your servant. Mm. David said to him, Fear not, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, grandfather, and you shall eat at my table always. And the crippled bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Seba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given you master's son, grandson, all that belong to Saul and to all his house. And you shall till the land for him, you, your sons, and your servants. And you shall bring in the produce that your master's heir may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, grandson, shall eat always at my table. Mm. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do according to all my lord the king commands. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. Amen. 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 Wow. David didn't just wake up one morning and say, is there anyone left in the house of Saul? See, when you make a covenant, you don't forget your covenant. Yes. Amen. He made a covenant with Jonathan, and he told Jonathan, I will take care of your household as much as you will take care of my household. God made a covenant with you, and you haven't forgotten about his covenant. This is about, this is a foreshadow of the covenant that God is making with us through his son, Jesus Christ. He has made a covenant with us that he has not forgotten about his covenant with us. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what has happened to you. And David didn't just wake up one morning and say, oh, let me see if there's anybody else. He says, no, I made a covenant with my friend, my brother, with Jonathan that I will take care of it. I need to know if there's anybody else left because I am not going behind you my covenant. My brothers, my sisters, you can break contracts, but you cannot break covenants. Amen. Covenants are eternal. Contracts can be broken. God made a covenant with Israel, cannot be broken. God made a covenant with Abraham, cannot be broken. God made a covenant with us, it cannot be broken. God made a covenant with his Ecclesia, it cannot be broken. A covenant is sealed and it's done and it's finished and the ones that make the covenant do not forget about it. Amen. A contract can be broken. It can be dismissed, but not a covenant. So David remembered his covenant with Jonathan and he woke up, he remembers his oath and he's making sure that he keeps what he made a covenant with. Please understand this morning, I'm trying to Seriously, I'm trying to let you guys go home quickly today. I, I, I have no desire to sit down and teach you today. But, but I, ha I feel I need to teach this. Yes, yes. You see, David understood that if I do not fulfill my covenant, whatever prophecy that was spoken over me will be broken, will, will be not be fulfilled. Oh. Mm -hmm. He understood that covenant are everlasting. Amen. And you miss the part of the covenant you make, you can mess up everything else. Mm. Because a covenant that is not fulfilled is a covenant that is that doesn't allow to be delivered. Christ made a covenant with us that he will save us through his blood. But in response, he asked us to make a covenant with him that my life belongs to you. Everything I do belongs to you. Everywhere I go belongs to you. 
that my waking belongs to you, my sleep belongs to you, my eating belongs to you, my, my, my working belongs to you, my speech belongs to you, everything belongs to you. And then he came back and he gave us the great commission. He says, now that I have fulfilled my part of the covenant and broke the curse of sin in your flesh and washed it by the blood of the Lamb and took the authority and dominion out of hell and gave it back to you. Now, go and preach the gospel. Tell them about this covenant. Tell them about this covenant that we have in the blood of Jesus. Don't forget your covenant. You want your prophecies to come to fulfillment? Don't forget the covenant. As a church, we cannot forget the covenant that God has with us. If we forget the covenant of God with us, we are going to miss the purpose of God in our life. He has a covenant. You can have millions of prophecies in your life, but if you don't fulfill your covenant, they will not come to pass. That is right. Wow. He is a God of covenants. Amen. Moses, I will send you to a land full of milk and honey. I make a covenant with you. But Moses, if you're going to rebuke what I'm telling you to do, you're breaking our covenant. Mm. Not that I break my covenant, you broke the covenant. Mm. You will see what I taste. Mm. God doesn't break his promises. He's not man to break them. David comes and says, is there anyone left at the house of Saul that I can show what? Kindness to. Sometimes you need to just be nice. Sometimes you need to be just nice. I don't know who I'm talking to, but your prophecy has been delayed because of your attitude. You got, you got to be bigger than that. You got to be stronger than that. You got to learn when to weep and you got to learn how to be tough. Amen. Your attitude is bigger than your promise. Sometimes you need to do things yes. as a liar and sometimes you got to do things as a liar. Mm -hmm. Christ didn't redeem us as a liar. He redeemed us as a lamb of God. Amen. You got to know when to be a tough and be when to be weak. He redeemed us as a lion. He redeemed us as a lamb of God. But he's returning back as a lion of Judah. Amen. We know what we need to know this times how to behave in every action that we act. So he called Ziba. Because Ziba was of the house of Saul. Ziba was not of the house of David. He was of the house of Saul. And sometimes you need the inside track. So he calls Ziba and says, Is there anyone left of the house of Saul whom I may show kindness? Just think about it now. Please understand this. When he called for Ziba, at that time, and, uh, and during those times of kingdom, whenever a king came to the throne, they had to kill everybody, that yes. nobody would be on their way. That's right. And when he called Ziba, when Ziba came to him, he was frightened. He thought, that is it. Yeah. He thought, here it is. He's going to kill me. Yes. That's right. And what he received was the contrary. Ziba, I'm not here to kill you, but I'm here to ask you. Is there anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show kindness to? He didn't ask anybody of the house of David about the house of Saul. He wants somebody who is inside the house of Saul. And he says, Ziba, are you part of the house of Saul? If then, you can tell me what it is. And I'm here to tell you that you and I need to look for people that know people that need Christ Jesus. Amen. Do you know anyone that needs salvation? Do you know anyone that needs a touch from God? Do you know anyone that needs the mercies of God? Do you know anyone that I can show how God is going to transform their life suddenly? Don't worry, I'm going to be nice. 
I want to show kindness to him or to her. He does not know if there's anybody left. And, and they said, there is nobody left except Jonathan, crippled child. He's down at Low Debron. Uh, and he's laying in his both feet. King David says, bring him out of Lord Abraham. Mephasabat is Jonathan's child, the one that nursed and dropped running. Trying to get away, he was five years old. He was a boy. His mate was holding him in his arm and he dropped him. And he was dropped. And because of the drop, he became lame in both of his feet. He would have been king, but he was lame in both of his feet. He would have been successor to the throne, but he was lame in his feet. He would have been living in the place that King David was living, but he was lame on both of his feet. He would have sat on his grandfather's throne and been rightful there, but rightful error, but he was lame in both of his feet. I want to talk to some people today that they feel they are lame. I want to talk to some people today that God has been calling you to a place, but you felt somebody dropped you. It wasn't your fault. Somebody dropped you. Somebody that's supposed to carry you dropped you. Somebody that's supposed to protect you actually hurts you. Somebody that's supposed to be your protector caused you to become something for the rest of your life that is not worthy to be a king. I want to talk to some people that end up in a situation that wasn't your fault, but somebody you were trusting has damaged you. Is there anybody here that knows what it's like to be damaged for years? To be broken for years, to be twisted for years, to be to be accused for years, to be crying for years, to be nervous for years, to be traumatized for years before they knew what PTSD was. My father, chef, had post post traumatic stress disorder. Can I still preach? Yes. He moved to Lodabra. Went down to Lodabra. He was the right person, but in the wrong place. Lodabra is a place. It has several meanings. And one of the meanings of Lodabra means no pasture. No pasture. There is no grazing place in Lodabra where King David had been promised in Psalms 23 that I lead you into green pastures. King David has green pastures, but King Saul's grandson has no green pastures. He was moved into Lodabra because Lodabra also means no communication. And when you have been dropped so bad enough, you can't talk about it. When you've been dropped bad enough, you don't write notebooks, you don't tell stories, you don't testify about it. When you've been dropped bad enough, it shutters your mouth. You have to experience it to know it. I know how it feels that you're afraid to open your mouth. I know how it feels that you're afraid to even say a word because the next word that comes out of your mouth, you're accused. I know what it feels to want to declare the word of God, but you'll be so hurt that you're afraid that you're going to get hurt again because you proclaim the word of God again. Talk about it again. 
Have you ever had something hurt you so bad that your mouth has been shut up and you had no communication left? Mm -hmm. You internalize the pain. Perhaps you're sitting here this morning and you're internalizing your pain for years and you're saying, it is well, it is fine, I know it's going to be okay, I, it doesn't matter, it's my portion to take and you're internalizing your pain and you are not willing to accept that this internal pain is not for you to keep, it's for God to deliver it. Amen. You don't verbalize the pain, you don't have the words to communicate how you feel, that is load of rock. Is trying to keep your mouth shut to declare what the Lord wants to do in your life. Mm. Trap your own in your own head, remembering what you wish you could forget. You wish you forget what was happening. You wish you didn't need to go to the work that you're going to. You wish you couldn't, you, you wish you didn't go to the home that you were going to. You wish that you didn't go see the friend that you were going to see. You wish that you were not in fellowship with people that you're fellowshipping in. You wish all of these things in your heart, but yet you are in that place. Perhaps you haven't experienced this, but I'm, I'm telling you, some folks have experienced this in this house. Perhaps you know what you have an experience with God, so powerful and so genuine, and God is using you mightily. You know that when you go home, something is waiting for you, so much more evil, to take the very breath of God out of you. And God is saying, I haven't forgotten my covenant with you. I've never forgotten my covenant with you. Yeah, you were dropped at five, but I haven't forgotten my covenant. Yes, you might be lame. It took a few years before David came to power. It took a few years for me to get you in the position that you have, but I haven't forgotten about my covenant with you. My covenant is yes and amen, and I'm not man to lie. I will fulfill my covenant to you in my in your life. Amen. Yes. Yes. Never could find words to express it, but God says, don't worry, I am in you. I wasn't born to be lame like this. I wasn't born wanting to be weak like this. I wasn't born wanting to be incompetent like this. I wasn't born wanting to be afraid. I wasn't born wanting to be weak. I wasn't born wanting to be a problem. I wasn't born wanting to be unstable, but something happened that caused me to be where I am today. Some people today in this room, they're supposed to be deans and professors, uh, they're supposed to be bank presidents, they're supposed to be scholars, they're supposed to be things that God has called you, but somebody dropped you a long way of the journey and you have not fulfilled what God has called you to be. You will be leading a team of experts or scientists, inventors. Somebody dropped you and you were living in your pain for so long that you forgot that you have a purpose in God. Amen. When somebody drops you, you get to the point that you say, nothing matters. You will find every way. My brothers and sisters, listen to the Holy Spirit. You will find every way to be lazy to cover your pain. Your pain becomes your security. Yes. Hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. Your pain becomes your security. Your lie becomes your reality. Your deception of yourself becomes your truth. Mm, wow. Richard, yes. And it causes you to find every single way to do what makes you be lazy. Because pain makes you lazy because pain makes you lazy. You will not be able to do something. You will be lazy because you're cherishing your pain. Spiritual pain, physical pain, mental pain. Every pain is not from God. When we cherish our pain, we're going to become lazy to fight the good fight of faith.
nothing, nothing can break it. Nothing can deliver you until you allow God to do it. Until you allow God to do it. There is no words I can do in you. There is no prayers that I can pray over you. There is not enough of laying of hands on you because the amount of hands I lay on you, you will be bruised. only a desire from God that you can be delivered. Amen. It's your desire wanting God to break it once for all in your life. And God give me a word for this season, for today, for where we're going, why we fasted, why we prayed, why we, we pressed on. Because God gave me a word and a direction. And uh, you have heard me before say March 21st is coming. And I am going to stand and be tough on the word of God. And I'm not going to allow things go by. Do you know what I mean by that? I mean I'm not going to let you to accept things that is not from God in your life. Amen. I'm not going to allow you to repeat the words of Satan. I can, but I won't allow you to repeat the words of God. That's again, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. I'm not going to allow you to confess death. I'm going to teach you and tell you every time you want to tell Satan death. He said, Oh, I have no power over this thing. I cannot control this thing. I will tell you, you need to stop talking nonsense and you need to stop talking. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in this world. You need to stop confessing the power of the covenant of the blood of Jesus Christ in you and the power of the covenant of the Holy Ghost in you. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not going to allow you to put yourself down in Lord of our any longer because God has a covenant with you. And you need to come out of your lazy, painful status and rise up in the power of the Holy Ghost. You need to rise up in the power of of the Holy Ghost. We need to rise up in the power of the Holy Ghost because God's covenant is yes and amen with you, my brothers and my sisters. He has a plan. He has a plan. He has a plan. And let me redefine it for you this morning when I said I won't be nice after March 21st. I'm not going to be nice not with you. I'm not going to be nice with Satan that is trying to deceive you. I'm going to go after him. I'm going to talk to him. I'm going to kick him where he needs to go. I'm going to talk to him. I'm not going to be nice to the spirit that is trying to control you any longer because I'm sick and tired of the church of the living God. Oh, it's the power of this God. It's the more and more power of God that is I'm sick and tired of all these poor people who are walking in the weakness of the flesh. I'm sick and tired. I'm not going to be nice to Satan any longer. And I'm not going to let you sleep in your Lord of all any longer. I'm going to allow you to communicate the words of God. Your pain is not going to stop you from declaring the word of God. Your pain is not going to put you behind closed doors. Your pain is not going to be in control of who you are. God is in control of the He has a covenant with you. He has a covenant with you. He has a covenant with you. God is going to break the shame on you. God is going to break the shame. God is going to break the silence. God is going to give you a shout of praise that you never had. On my way to South Town, I had four different spiritual attacks. And I was standing behind the group and I was jumping up and down. I said, Hallelujah! Jesus is Lord. And somebody told me, Oh, it's because you're cold. I said, No, because I know my Redeemer lives. I'm not jumping up and down because I'm cold. I refuse to allow those attacks to defy the moment of God that has for me in this moment. I refuse it. I refuse it. We need to refuse. We need to refuse. We need to rise up. We need to refuse to allow the enemy to dictate who we are. We need to refuse it. Yes. We need to grab 
a hold of the horns of the altar of God. Yes. Burn those insecurities. Yes. Burn those attacks. Burn those pains at the altar. Yes. Give him as a sacrifice offering before the Lord. Lord, here is my, my God, here is my uh, ungrateful boss. I sacrifice them before you. God, here is the people that have hurt me. I sacrifice them before you. God, I'm offering them as a living sacrifice to you because I have much more to give you than what they try to control me. And they cannot cover me any longer. They've been covering me for too long. My pain has been over me too long. It's been a burden on my shoulder for too long. It's keeping my mouth, my, my, my face will be covered. It has kept my mouth shut up. And I've been li living like this, oh God, and walking around, hiding behind the glory when you want to show forth your glory. We see whales of glory walking in pain when God says, I want to show you my glory all of you. Remember what God told us at the beginning of this year. I'm going to birth my glory out of you. I'm birthing my glory out of you. You're going to foreshadow, forecast my glory out of you. People will see my glory out of you. Our city needs a revival. Yes. Our nation is a revival. Yes. Not in this house. Our entire nation is a revival. Yes. We need a revival with God. But we need people who are in revival. Yes. We need people who are excited about Jesus Christ. Yes. We need people that want to do the will of Jesus Christ. Yes. God is going to birth you into a life that thinks that the past have no longer control over of you. And they are going to be mad about you. God is about to do this because your spirit has been in the wrong place and God is bringing your spirit in the right place. The Fabashan was in the wrong place. Get ready to have somebody pack your bags. Tell them to pack your bags. You gotta move from what God is ready to do in your life. You gotta get out of Lodabar. You cannot stay in Lodabar any longer. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, get out of Lodabar. <laughs> neighbor, get out of your depression. Get out of your fear. Get out of your silence. Get out of your anxiety. Get out of your being nervous. Get out of being intimidated. Get out of being insecure. Get out of being afraid. Get out of it. Get out of Lodabar. God is here to get you out. And he's calling you by name. And he asks is there anyone left that I can show my favor and my kindness to? Yes, Who is yes, in the house yes. that needs the kindness of God this morning? God is yes. coming. Yes. Have your stuff. You live in Bogomar. Yes. And you come in to make him stable. I haven't forgotten my covenant with you. I have not forgotten what I promised you. And I will fulfill it unto your children's children. And that is my promise to you. And I said, I will bless you. I said, I will bless you a thousand generations. Your children will be blessed. Your grandchildren will be blessed. Your great grandchildren will be blessed. But you need to come and walk in my covenant. I am calling you all this morning. I'm calling you all this morning. God is saying, get ready. Oh, Lazarus, come out. Come out of your anxiety. Come out of your nervousness. Come out of your securities. Come out of all your fears. God is standing in the presence of you right now. And he's telling you, come out. I am here. Come out. Come out. Fear not, for I am with thee. Fear not, for I am with thee. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus, this morning. Help me, Jesus, this morning. Tell your neighbor, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm crippled, but I'm leaving. I'm scared, but I'm leaving. I'm being intimidated, but I'm leaving. I'm in pain, but I'm leaving. God is calling me out of this. God is telling me to leave this. Leave me to do this. Leave your sickness. Leave your pain. Leave your hurt. Leave your insecurity. I do not know. There are a bunch of insecure people in this house. God says, leave your insecurity. If I'm going to go, you know, I was insecure for many years that I was going to go bald. And I God said, I'm going to take your insecurity away. Shave it off. Don't worry. If you go bald, you still have some. If you 
world, you still be doing God, God, that's what you Don't be insecure in your boldness. Know that I am greater in you. It's not your hair that makes you insecure. It's the greatness of God that makes me. It's not your mohawk that makes you a great creature. It's the only mohawk that makes you a great creature. situation is five years old but you have grown up and you need to grow up and you need to walk in my power I want to talk to you this morning I don't want you to I don't want you to admit because you want to stay cute oh. I want you to admit because nobody except Christ Jesus has delivered you amen nobody you know it and I know it Brother Frankie, you know it very well as much as I know. Amen. Brother Jeff, you know it as well as I know. Amen. That nothing could deliver us from our sins. Yes. It was the power of God. Amen. It was the blood of Jesus. 
That's why we stand on the street and preach. Because we know what He delivered us all from. We know what we were doing Friday night. We know what we were planning to do Friday night. What did you say, Brother Frankie, the other day about the fire? Can you repeat it again? When you were sold out for the, for the thing, you were saying something with me, if you remember. The same way that you had a, you were enslaved to sins and you were doing the will of the sins. Oh, yes. Can you say, just stand up and say it loud, you don't need a mic. Yeah. And I remember on that fiery moment, like Paul was preaching, and he said, as much as you you not burning for the world, that start burning for the Lord. Yes, amen. 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 Did you hear that? Give him the mic. I don't think they heard you. Say it again. <laughs> say it again. No, no, say it again. It's the word that God gave you. Say it again. I don't preach people's messages. Go. <laughs> I didn't hear no, nobody heard you. I didn't hear you. Say it again. Okay, as much as <laughs> yes, yes, as much as you you serve the world, yes, before the Jesus Christ, amen. As much as he was burning for your desires to do what you did before Christ, as much as he put on fire and burning for the Lord today, amen. 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 The same fire that we had for sin, amen. we have to have a greater fire for glory. Yes. The truth of the matter, you can get out of Lodabar by yourself. But good news is, David asked Ziba, Ziba, where is she? He said, in the house of Maya, and he's down at Alabar. God wants you to know today, he knows exactly where you are. I feel this morning that you think that God forgotten where you are, but God knows exactly where you are. He knows your address. Everybody else might have forgotten about you, but God hasn't forgotten about you. He has a hold of your life. He has kept you for such a time as this. Everybody else might have been taught that you've never amount to nothing, but God kept a hold on your life for such a time as this. May I submit to you this morning that if he wasn't dropped, and if he wasn't crippled, and if he wasn't been hiding in Lodabar, the enemies of the house of Saul would have killed him. All right, you missed it. Why? If he was not dropped, if he didn't become lame, and if he wasn't hidden in Lodomar, every son, every grandson, every child, every man of the house of Saul was killed by the enemies, yeah. including one of his sons that took on charge. We read about it last week. Including one of his sons, his own man killed him. Don't think that God did not know what he's doing because he had a promise with Jonathan and David had a promise to each other. And God says, you will not forsake your promise and I will keep your covenant alive and I will allow a drop to fall in order for you to fulfill your promise. Wow. God kept him secure for such a time as this, that David would come on his throne. The Lord wants me to tell you that he got your address and he knows where you live, baby. He hasn't forgotten about you. The Lord knows it. Your situation doesn't describe your identity. Your circumstances doesn't identify who you are. He's coming to get you. Yes. You've been down long enough. You've cried long enough. You've been de depressed long enough. You've been weary long enough. You've been impaired long enough. God is coming to get you. Amen. Pack your bags. He's coming to get you. He's coming to get you. I know nobody wants to be in Lodabar. But if you don't think anybody cares about you, you will stay there. Here comes Lord Jesus. So when Saiba brought Mephibosheth into the place of 
King David, he fell on his face. And David looked at him, not even recognized him, and said, Is that you? Some folks will not even recognize you today because of what you have been through. You can understand how you did it and how you end up like this. The man's legs are broken. And he said, Here I am at your service. Think about it for a second. He is an error of the he's an error of kingship. His legs are broken. And he bows down before King David and says, Here I am at your service. What kind of service can you do for me, lame man? But he had a spirit of humility that God could use to glorify him himself through him. And then David says, Let me tell you something. You're not here to serve me. I have a covenant. Can I bring this a little bit closer to us at home? The Lord Jesus is telling us, I don't need you to do anything for me. I've done it all for you. I'm just asking you to repeat what I've already done. I just need you to do what I've done. I don't need you to save nobody for me because I've already done the saving. You just need to deliver the mail. Isn't that what the scripture says? He didn't say to us, go save people. He says, go preach to them. I do the saving. I do the healing. You just deliver the mail. That's all I'm asking you. Deliver the mail. I'm not asking you to serve me. I'm asking you to be obedient to me. He bowed down before the king, and the king said, he saw him in his crippled situation. I was crippled in my sin, and the Lord saved me. Amen. You were crippled in your sin, and he saved you. Amen. He gave you something that you could never attain in your own power and strength. Mm -hmm. Eternal life. Yeah. Eternal life. Amen. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to give you, David says, I'm going to give you all of your father's land. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness of it. Amen. Now, Lord Jesus says, I have all power, all dominion on earth, and I'm giving it to you. Amen. I'm giving you everything that belongs to my Father's house. Amen. Ali, I'm giving you everything from the Father's house. Mm. Vic, I'm giving you everything from the Father's house. Whoever your name is, I'm giving you everything that belongs to the Father's house. Amen. I'm giving it to you. I'm going to give you stuff you didn't even work for. As Brother Frankie was sharing so powerfully this morning about the prosperity of life is not what we look for. It's an addition of what God adds unto us. Yes. I'm going to give you houses that you need to live in. I'm going to give you cars that you need to drive. I'm going to give you all those things. But all I want you to do is keep my covenant. Live in my covenant. Amen. You will have houses that you did not build. You will have cars that you did not pay for. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to provide jobs for you that you're not qualified for. We are not seeking those things. 
those things come and it's added to us. That's why we don't preach things in this church. We preach Christ Jesus crucified. We preach Christ Jesus crucified because that is the only way we can get the, the things that God wants to give us. We are seeking first the kingdom of God and all His righteousness. Those things will be added on to you. Everything you need will be added on to you. Whatever is the need of your life will be added on to you. He will add it to you. So when the scripture says that God will give us houses that we did not build, He didn't say, go and prophesy about it. He says, go do my will and I will do it for you. This is why the prosperity message is so wrong. Every prophetic yeah. word, every message is about you making money. Yeah. You, you, you. Yeah. It's a heresy. Those are things that God will add on to us. It's part of your inheritance. Amen. But God wants you to know why we are increasing in this house spiritually, physically, <coughs> mentally. In every aspect, God wants you to know every house that is increasing, why they're increasing. And I'm not talking about the house of the world, I'm talking about the houses of God. Yeah. Every house of God that is increasing, a healthy growth. Let me rephrase it a healthy growth. Yes. Many years ago, I heard somebody said, You can grow two ways. You can go in gym and work out and build muscle and have walk up and have big legs, whatever. Or you can have an infection and have the same size of a leg as an infection. One is healthy, one is killing you. You're right. Every house that is growing healthy in the world, the houses of God, it's because of one reason. Do you know what it is? Do you want to know what it is? Yes. I will read it for you. I don't want you to turn to it. I will read it for you. This is the reason that they're growing healthy. They're growing in every aspect because they're doing this. And Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Amen. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, always even unto the end of the world. Anybody that does this is seeking the kingdom of God first and all his righteousness. And that house will grow healthy. That house will grow strong. That house will be delivered from many things. Both a collective house of God and also an individual house of yourself. An individual house of yourself as well. We've been marked by the blood of the Lord Jesus. Our faith is alive. For we are not just saved by faith, but the faith that produces work of God in us. If you missed it here, it's again. We are not just faith. We are not just saved by faith. We are, we are doing the work of the faith that saved us. Faith without works is dead. If we know that we can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us, then we need to show it. If we know that we're delivered by the power of the Holy Ghost and by the power of the blood, then we need to show it. If we know what God is doing, we need to show it. 
We've been fast forward by our Lord Jesus to the season no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither entered the mind of man. Amen. Can I say this in this way? We're already experiencing it. Yes. Brother Frankie and I were talking on Friday afternoon. And we were sharing this word. They said, they said, they said Brother, we are, we are living a miracle. Many of you might think going downtown at the art gallery, anybody can do it. That's not true. You need to have a permit to preach. Right, Brother Frankie? You need to get a permit from the city to preach on the street. And not amplify it. Just preach. You need to get a license from the city hall to preach. To amplify, there is another license. There is a lot of fees that you have to pay. We are living, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither enter the mind of man, but God has the soul. We are seeing that not only we are preaching, we are setting up shop. Amplify it. Setting up a tent in the middle of the city is impossible to do it. I'm telling you, you need to understand something. Not, you cannot just go in the middle of the city and set up a tent and chairs and coffee and tea and all sorts of things and love music and everything and no police and no city hall coming and asking you, do you have a permit? We are living a miracle. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. So be sure that the enemy will attack. But God says, come out. Time to come out. Time to show up. Time to show that I am not going to let what I believe can hold me back, hold me back. I will walk in the power of God. We are into, we are stepping into a season of press down, shaking together, running over. And here is the grandson saying to King David, Who am I? See this day, how I know that it wasn't just his feet that was lame, his mentality was lame also, because it caused, caused, caused him to say, I'm a dead dog. Some of the pains that you have in your life will also make your mind become like you don't feel you're nobody. Your situations. Who am I? Just a dead dog. The, guy, the king's grandsons thought he was a dead dog. But he is right in the place where he got it wrong. He's right, sorry, he's now in the right place, but he has the wrong attitude. That's why God, through his son, Jesus Christ, preaches to us the Beatitudes. Blessed are those. Blessed are those. He's saying, you can be in the right place. You can be in the presence of God, but have the wrong attitude. That's right. I'm not going to preach you the bad attitudes. Go home and read it. Your attitude of what you need to be in Christ Jesus dictates how you can walk in the victories of Christ Jesus. Yeah. Blessed are the peacemakers that they shall inherit. What? Sorry? What? Say it again. Blessed are who? Peacemakers. And they shall know what? Inherit what? Inherit the earth. How? Soul after soul after soul after soul. That's our inheritance. Blessed are the meek. Why? Do what? They shall see the kingdom. See the kingdom of God. They shall see the kingdom of God. You want to see the kingdom of God? If you don't get anything today, go home and read the realities. You can be in the right place, but have the wrong attitude. And God says, your attitude has to get fixed. That's why I said, after March 21st, we're going to fix attitudes. <laughs> attitudes that reflect the Word of God. Attitudes that will declare the Word of God. Attitudes that will live the Word of God. Attitudes that will proclaim the Word of God. 
not what the enemy wants to tell us. The enemy wants to remind me who I used to be, but that person is dead and long time gone. I am not who I used to be because I'm born again. Ali of 2001 is in grave. Does not exist. He's dead. Sometimes we need to ask ourselves a question. But frankly, I can talk to you because you and I are cool. Everybody else is angry at me. <laughs> huh? But you know what, Brother Frank, what I'm trying to say is, if Frankie of 13 years ago, 14 years ago, was still alive, there's a problem. <laughs> because he's still not a new creature. But if you're a new creation, that Frankie is not a wrong. That Frankie is six feet under, and the new Frankie is resurrected in Christ Jesus. The Son of God, living by the power of the Holy Ghost, declaring the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent and receive the kingdom of God in your life. King David says, don't worry about it. I've been already made allowance. I know I just gave you something that you're not qualified for. I know by right I should be killing you, but by right I'm giving you life. Jesus Christ is saying the same thing to us. By right I should be killing you for your sins, but by my blood I'm giving you my righteousness. And I'm marking you by my glory. I'm not going to give you a blessing because of what you think. I'm going to give you a blessing because what I see that you can be. And I will give you the provision for it to do what you need to do. I'm going to raise up people who are strong and are not going to be weak. I'm going to take people that are going, going, going to come and be not a pressure to your feet. And I'm going to remove the pressures on your feet. And I'm going to give you what I can give you only. He said to King David, he said to Mephibosheth, chef. Praise God. You know what I'm talking about. Miffy. Miffy. They call him Miffy. As long as you live, as long as you live, you will always have a seat at my table. Though I walk through the valley of shadow. The key word is through, not to stay. Through, not to stay. Through, not to stay. Through, not to stay. Though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, it is necessary for me to walk through the valley. It is necessary for the anointing that is coming on my head to go in through the valley. Because when God is putting me on the table, He's not just going to put an anointing on me. No. He's going to invite my enemies. And I will fear no evil. Because I know His rod and His stuff comforts me. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For I know thou art with me. Thy staff and thy rod comforts me. I will fight for you. His staff is there to fight for you. He's fighting for you. Amen. Lord Jesus is walking with you, using you, and his weapons of warfare and his authority to destroy the evil is walking in you and through you. And once the table is not, once you are at the table, it's not only what I will receive, but what he has already done. An anointing that will say, I will dwell in the house of God all the days of my life. The Lord has invited us to his table. For what purpose? That we will dwell in the house of God. To dwell in the house that he has placed us. He has a house for each one of us. And I shall dwell in the house of God all the days of my life. Why? Because iron sharpens iron. Fellowship brings strength. 
That's why I, I believe this with all my heart. And I told this, I, I believe it. This is what I believe strongly with my heart. You cannot be a Christian and not have a church. And have no fellowship. Yes. Impossible. It's impossible. Because you are an isolated person that has no direction. <coughs> it's not biblical. When we was at our only church, I need church. I need to be put together. I need to be corrected. I need to be taught. I have church with my with the elders. I have church with people who are over me. I have church all the time. I have church with you. I have church also at this church. And I have church all the time. I need the church. I need the ecclesia. Because I need sharp iron sharp as I am. When people say, oh no, I don't need the church because God is my God is everywhere I am. It's very clear. Where two or more gather in my name. It's that simple. And what did they say at the end of the you know we like the first part of the Psalms? We like the first part of it in Psalm 33, you know, that through the green pastures, do I walk through the valley, and we like the part that he will anoint me in the presence of my enemies and so forth. Then we stop there. But David didn't stop there. He says that I will dwell in the house of God yeah. all the days of my life. And what will happen to me? Surely. Not her. Surely. Goodness and mercies shall follow me all the days of my life. Lord Jesus is not only with me, but he is in me. He's not only with me, he is in me. I know it sounds very powerful when we call him Yahweh and we call him Emmanuel. It sounds wow. Sophisticated. Jehovah. But the Bible is very clear. His name is Jesus. His name is above all names. And his name is Jesus. Because in his name, in the name of Jesus, there is the great I am. There is Emmanuel. There is the healer. There is the deliverer. Everything that you need is in that precious name of Jesus. And you know what? We had an encounter on Friday. This man that I call Santa Claus. <laughs> Trust me, I was dealing with a bunch of stuff. And then, Brother Frank, you get ready because you're next here. You're next. Yeah, you have to share what you have to share. But it's okay. People have to go to the same home. That's fine. This feels important. And 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 uh, and this man on Friday he was Santa Claus, yeah. As soon as I was dealing with my other three other stuff, and I finally found some peace in my heart to go to the to the to, to where I supposed to be, I prayed up. I see Santa Claus at the table. And I thought, for the friend, I said, what, do you call for Christmas? <laughs> you know this is not me. I said, I know, I know, it's an enemy, it's the enemy. But you know what? Afterwards, I knew it wasn't the enemy, it was God. God actually was doing something powerful. And he showed up, and he starts saying, don't say the name of Jesus. That's a Greek word. His name is Emmanuel. That's what the Bible says in Isaiah. I said, I know his name is Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. Yahweh. I said, I know he's Yahweh. Mm -hmm. But you are calling him Jesus. I said, because you're speaking on behalf of other demons here. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible says, at the name of Je Jesus, every knee every shall bow. Every tongue shall come. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Mm -hmm. 
demons will tremble at the name of Jesus. And that is the reason people do not want the name of Jesus to be professed. That's why we're professing Jesus Christ crucified. That's why we know he's Emmanuel, but now he's Christ Jesus that is living in us. And the more we were saying Jesus, the more that he was getting aggravated. But you know what? It's all right. He needs deliverance too. Amen. We pray for him as well. Yep. And I found out, figured, we, we finally figured out through half of it through the service. We said, thank you, Lord. It was because you're telling us you're going to face this kind of things all the days of your life. Because nobody's offended by the name of Emmanuel. No. Nobody's offended by God. Tell everybody, God bless you. They're not offended. But the name of Jesus is an offense. The Bible says the name of Jesus is an offense. The name of Jesus is an offense. The name of Jesus is an offense to religion and also to what? Obscure nonsense to philosophy. But we proclaim Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So I'm asking you today. I'm begging you today. I'm pleading with you today. We have a covenant with our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. And our Lord Jesus Christ is saying to us, fulfill your part of the covenant. Yes. Fulfill the great commission. Come Friday. Young, old, weak, strong, come Friday. 6 p.m. Let's walk all of our insecurities. What I can do or can't do and come do everything that the Lord wants you to do. Amen. There are promises that God has for you. Amen. But God is a God of covenant. Yes. And he wants us to fulfill his words every day. I let Brother Frankie and Emily share. But uh, Let's just go before the Lord. Let's go before the Lord. And let's just let this song minister to you. You don't need to get up, just sit down, let the song just minister to you. Let the Holy Spirit minister to you.